to have really prominent tenured professors at major university uh, defending multiverses and saying that testability falsification is overrated, I, I think is a really bad trend. There is, there is room for just, just pure thought uh, and imagination, but within this, this straitjacket of, of mathematics, just because a theory is not predictive in the future doesn't mean to say it's not going to yield something fantastic and revolutionize our understanding of the universe. So, welcome to this afternoon's debate, Dreams of the Universe. From string theory to M-theory, from multiverses to parallel universes, modern cosmology and particle physics looks increasingly exotic and untestable. It may be very good for selling books, but is it bad science? Should we return to empirical evidence, or should imagination have its playground? Well, to discuss this, we've got three people eminently placed to give us some interesting insights. Uh, John Horgan, who's author of The End of Science, and who's a critic of the lack of experimentation in contemporary physics and science. David uh, Tong, who's Cambridge professor of theoretical physics, and he's had a go at trying to provide us with some, to indicate some observational tests that could be applied to our early stories of the universe. And Tara Shears is a particle physicist um, works on the Large Hadron Collider and is investigating the problems that are put forward by current particle physics. Physics is what drew me into science journalism uh, in, the 19, in the early 1980s. Uh, the ambitions of uh, physicists back then were, were so uh, grand so um, uh, Stephen Hawking had this essay that I think uh, he wrote for what he, he became a, a professor at, uh, at Cambridge uh, about the possibility of a final theory of physics and that would be so powerful that it would answer all the deepest questions that uh, physicists and also philosophers and anybody who thinks about their place in the universe have struggled with uh, forever. So, one thing that he wanted a final theory to do was to unite quantum mechanics and relativity, which now are in very different uh, mathematical languages, and he, and he and many other physicists thought that there should be one uh, tidy mathematical uh, package for describing all the, the forces and uh, particles of nature. But what really excited me was the possibility that Hawking and others uh, spelled out of this theory saying where the universe came from in the first place. Um, you know, why? Wh where did this reality come from? Well, you know, what preceded the Big Bang, if anything? And why is, does the universe have the structure that we observe? Why does it have uh, uh, the, the laws and particles um, that allow us to exist? They created this, uh, the, this marvelous uh, life that we uh, that we find ourselves in right now, and you know, so Einstein had this famous phrase. He wanted to know if God had any choice in the universe, uh, in uh, creating the universe. And what Hawking and others thought would be that the final theory would eliminate this sense of our universe being kind of arbitrary. It could have been many other ways. Uh, that there would be this logical necessity to the universe. Um, that would make it, you know, if you alter it uh, to, this, um, to this final theory, that if you alter it in any way, the whole thing would fall apart. And, uh, you know, I believed in that. I was really excited about it. Uh, you had this theory, string theory, that appeared uh, late 70s, early 1980s, that some of the smartest people in the world thought was the answer. It was going to be the final theory. And the problem that I had uh, after a while was that, um, you know, I, I, I was looking for progress in string theory. Others were looking for progress as well. And it became apparent that this theory was postulating uh, phenomena that could never be experimentally accessed. So strings themselves are so infinitesimal that it would take a particle accelerator many light years around if you scale up from 
current technology to get to that energy level and that distance scale. Um, and the, the theorists, the proponents, kept assuring me that th these issues were uh, going to be resolved. And if anything, it seems like there's been a step backward. So um, you guys can uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that now it appears that there are virtually an infinite number of uh, versions of string theory, 10 to the 500 power is the number I've seen. And the problem is it can, ex it can predict any possible thing that you observe which means it's not really predicting anything. There's no way to uh, falsify it. Um, and then the, some of the, the true believers have tried to turn this into a strength of the theory instead of a flaw, and they have said, well, actually, all those possibilities predicted by string theory exist in these other universes out there, which seems to me to be um, just taking your advocacy to the point of absurdity. And to me, I see theoretical, you know, these are brilliant people, but I, 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 to me, it's become almost pathological the degree to which some of these uh, theorists are clinging to uh, these old ideas and not trying to find other avenues for solving some of these problems. I, I think it might be useful just, just to give you um, all uh, a sense of perspective about, about where physics is right now, what we know, what, what, what we don't know. Um, I think physics is really healthy. I think it can take your kicking, John. I, I'm <laughs> not concerned in the slightest. Um, you know, the, the, the question was, uh, you know, experimental theory, should we concentrate on one more, more than the other? As far as I can tell, we're focusing all our efforts on, on both of these, and they're both equally important. Um, there's some areas of physics where um, we do very well, where the theory is very strong, the experiment is very strong, and they just fit together perfectly. Um, so the great example is particle physics, the, the, the question to what are we all made of at the most fundamental level. We have this amazing theory of physics. Um, it's by far the best theory in the history of science. We give it a rubbish name. We call it the standard model. Um, but it predicts every single experiment we've ever done uh, in a particle accelerator. It predicts the result with, with, in some cases, unprecedented accuracy. In some cases, to, to 10 decimal places. You know, you, you do the calculation, you do the theory, uh, you do the experiment, they just match perfectly one digit after another. So that, that's really, you know, a, a poster boy for what science should look like. Um, then there's other areas of uh, physics like cosmology. How did the universe start? What began the universe? Um, we just don't know the answer to that. That's That's very simple, um, but we do know what was happening for sure 10 to the minus 20 seconds after the beginning of the universe. That's pretty impressive, I and mean, we really uh, understand very, very well what was going on experimentally and theoretically, and we think we understand what was going on 10 to the minus 30 seconds after the beginning of the Big Bang. There's a theory called inflation, um, which over the last uh, 15 years has just got very, very compelling experimental evidence that, that this is what's what's happening. So again, I, th I think we're, we're very well set in, in, in understanding these two areas. Um, then there are areas of, of physics, and, and John, you mentioned string theory, um, where we don't yet have any experimental evidence whatsoever. The, the questions that we're asking are hard questions, and we haven't built experiments to, to test them yet. Um, so instead, you have to rely on um, logic. You have to rely on mathematical consistency. Is it possible to write down a mathematical theory that includes both quantum mechanics and gravity? Um, the answer turns out to be yes. It took us uh, 20 years to figure this out, and in the subsequent 30 years, we still haven't really understood this, this theory. We still haven't really understood what it's about because, because it's hard. Um, so there are these very difficult questions. Um, and John, you said never. We can never test string theory. Never's a long, long time. Um, I don't know when we're going to test string theory. I don't know if it's going to be in the next uh, 10 years. It may not even be in my lifetime. But the questions we're trying to answer are so important that we've got to try. You know, you've got to have a go at uh, figuring out what's happening here. Physics isn't in trouble. I think we have a really healthy way in which our scientific process works mm -hmm. in physics. Maybe because I'm in particle physics and it's operating successfully, but we have theories that try and understand reality. We have data that is our interpretation of reality. We confront the theories with data to winnow out those interpretations that match reality from those that don't. And equally, we have the underlying theory to give our experimental observations context, to make them meaningful. And that's very important. These two approaches go hand in hand. 
Now, in the introduction to this session, you encouraged us perhaps to consider multiverses and string theory as bad science. I think that's really unfair. I think that in terms of developing our theoretical understanding and providing tools that can benefit all manner of theoretical investigations, they're extremely good theoretical science. And that imagination that allows you to step back from the straitjacket of our current understanding, where, as David says, we're limited. There are things that we know experimentally in the universe that we cannot explain with our existing understanding. You have to get out of that mindset to make progress. You need imagination. And this is where string theory and multiverse start to come in to fill the gap. Okay, they're nowhere near making predictions yet, so as an experimentalist, I like to sit back and think, well, it's a great idea, I love it, but I can't test it, so it's an idea, it's not the theory yet. But in order to make progress, you need a whole spectrum of understanding. You need your current understanding that works, you need the list of holes in it, so for example, dark matter, the behavior of antimatter, the unification of gravity with our, the rest of our understanding, these are all big issues for us. You need the theories that try and plug the gap, becoming yeah, more and more speculative, I grant you, but progress will be made theoretically, and one of these is, or, well, may, may pay off and extend our understanding, and that's invaluable, so you can't dismiss it. I mean, re really, we don't know what's going to come out. Just because a theory is not predictive in the future doesn't mean to say it's not going to yield something fantastic and revolutionize our understanding of the universe in the future. So. I think we're healthy, and we should go on being healthy. Is experiment essential to progress in science? Is it, is it, is it critical? Ultimately, it's, it, it's essential. Yeah, it's how you know things are, are right or wrong. <laughs> Particularly, it's how you know things are wrong. That, that's really what, what it's about, right? Falsifying uh, your theories. Um, but there's two pillars of of physics, and both are important. So one of them is, is experiment, which tells you if you're right or wrong, um, but the, the other one is, is simply mathematical consistency. That, that's really where the power of physics comes from. It's what allows you to be logically precise. It sort of allows you to be, to be accurate. Um, there have been many cases in the history of science where, where that was what led to development, was just people trying to understand a mathematically consistent way to, to explain the world, from Einstein developing general relativity, Paul Dirac, staring into his fireplace in St. John's College in Cambridge and suddenly realizing there must be antimatter in the world. And that was an incredible breakthrough in the history of science. Three years later, it, it, it was discovered. So there is, there is room for just, just pure thought uh, and imagination, but within this, this straitjacket of, of mathematics, um, which, you know, makes it, which makes it harder, but also uh, to make, to make uh, progress just because it's so difficult to, to write something mathematically consistent. But it means that if you can, you sort of feel that you've got something important. Uh, but do we think that, uh, is there any reason to believe that if uh, we're able to discover, as it were, something in mathematics, I'm not sure whether discover is quite the right word, but anyway, if we discover something in mathematics, that then that applies to the universe? I mean, is there any reason why there should be a connection? That's a, that's a good question. I don't really know the answer. It, it's certainly true that um, much Astonishing mathematics was discovered by mathematicians and then later had, had application to, to our universe. So, so a very good example is uh, a guy called Riemann in the 1800s was thinking about how spaces could bend and, and curve. It was purely mathematical. It turned out what he developed was what physicists now call the general theory of relativity. It was the theory of gravity and, and, and space and time, really just you know, almost the theory uh, in completeness. Um, why that's the case, I have no idea. But it, it's certainly true that, that Mathematics is the language in which theoretical physics is written. It's a powerful language, and, and we really have to keep hold of that. Okay. Um, so, w what's different about the present? We, surely theories have always preceded um, experiments, haven't they? I mean, yeah. The way I, I think about it is that um, you know you look at the course of of uh, physics in the, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, and and the experimentalists and the theorists were sort of playing hopscotch. Uh, you know, the interaction was um, very close. Uh, the, the theorists would predict something, and then the experimentalists uh, would confirm or, or, or disprove that, and then the experimentalists would often uh, find something that was totally unpredicted by uh, the theorists, so they would scramble to explain that, and as a result, you got this unbelievable 
progress for most of the 20th century. It seems to me that with the advent of uh, string theory and other uh, quantum gravity theories, which really started getting popular in the 1980s, the theorists kind of jumped uh, beyond uh, the planet, they, they, so far beyond the, the uh, uh, range of experiment that that interaction was lost. I, I can give you, you know, an, an example from, from, from history. Um, atoms. So, so most people would say that, that atoms were, were first postulated by the Greeks, but you know, I don't want to claim they had thousands of years in development. Let, let's go for the early 1700s when atoms first uh, entered modern scientific discourse. Uh, Bernoulli started thinking about atoms as explaining some properties of, of gases. Um, there was no predictions from atoms. It was just a nice way to think about gases. Well, you didn't learn anything new about gases from, from thinking about atoms. Um, it took a long time for people to realize that atoms were, were, were real objects. I, you, know, you could date it in, in different ways. Maybe the 1880s, when Boltzmann started thinking seriously about atoms. Some people would say 1905, when Einstein first uh, came up with experimental you know, proof that, that, that atoms existed. But either way, you're looking at you know, almost a 200-year time span between when atoms were first postulated in science and when we you know, could finally be sure that, that they existed. Um, string theory has been around about 30 years. Um, maybe it takes 200, maybe it takes longer than that, or maybe it's, it's sooner, and I, I don't know. That's kind of what research is, is about. It's about not knowing and being on the edge of knowledge. So I, I certainly don't think it's, it's not science. Is there any point at which you just say that this is a dead end? I mean, that's, what, uh, that's the question that I would have for, for string theorists. Uh, it's, it's been actually going back to the late 70s when you started getting some of the first ideas in, uh, in string theory. And uh, as I said, as far as I can tell, they're actually going backwards away from any kind of uh, experimental uh, testability. Yeah, I think there has been a little bit of a retreat. So I should tell people that, that string theory first was developed in the 70s um, as a way to understand how nuclei are held together. It was a speculative theory for this. It turns out it has nothing to do with how nuclei uh, uh, stick together. People realized that what they had on their hands was a theory of quantum gravity. Um, so this really came to fruition about 1984. I think that, that's when you should date the beginning of string theory as we know it. Um, and then there was, at this time, this, this huge optimism that here was this, this wonderful, unique theory that maybe could explain everything, maybe could explain what we'll, we'll see in the LHC. Um, it turns out that that's, at least in my opinion, just, just not possible. String theory operates on such a small distance scale that we're not going to test it in the LHC. I, I think it's, it's very unlikely. I have colleagues that, that disagree. Um, but I think it's a very remote possibility that we'll see evidence of string theory there. Um, but again, that doesn't mean you should, you should stop. We were wrong about whether or not we'll see it at the LHC, but there's certainly possibilities to see it in other places. Tara, I mean, at what point should we give up uh, a theory <laughs> if it doesn't, if we don't have evidence for it? So you're asking an experimentalist. I'm, <laughs> we're really hard-nosed about this. And I have a, a certain sympathy with John because at the moment for us as experimentalists, string theory falls into the not even wrong camp of theories. It, it's impossible to prove one way or the other. You, you can never prove that something's right because you can never make that infinity of measurements that you would need to, to say that. But as David says, it's very easy to prove that something's wrong. You just need one measurement. String theory uh, proposes supersymmetry. Uh, we've been looking for it for a long time. We haven't found it. So at what point do we say, well, we've got it wrong? We can only make that ultimate decision once we've exhausted every possibility of where we can find it. And the trouble with supersymmetry, and again, this is another thing that's a problematic if you're an experimentalist, supersymmetry is a good theory for us to try and explain the um, composition of dark matter. And if you look at the amount of stuff in the universe, dark matter is 85% of it. You know, we've actually quantified very little of it. We haven't found any evidence to support this theory, and it was thought when the LHC started it would be one of the first things that we would see. Because we haven't seen any evidence of it, though, it hasn't actually ruled out the theory, and that's because the theory is so elastic, it has so many unknowns in it, that it can incorporate mm. the fact that we haven't seen it yet. Mm. The new particles that it predicts as existing might just be too massive for us to have generated inside the LHC so far. It might be something that becomes more apparent when we restart next year at higher energies. It might be beyond our reach. The supersymmetry, because it has so many free parameters, you can only rule it out once you've explored every allowed value for every single one of those. And that's why it's such a nightmare, because it's an almost infinite space. But 
but m might not that be also a weakness, as John was saying, that, that no, somehow well. the very elasticity of the theory, which you're pointing to That's a strength, she's talking is about. also a weakness that uh, if it's too elastic, then somehow it can fit with anything. Was that she, what you the, the problems with super, supersymmetry are, are, are different in kind than the problems with right. string theory. Supersymmetry could just be right beyond the energy levels that we're, we're at now, that you know, the, the theories are predicted at, yeah. at different uh, yeah. energy levels. The problem with string theory and multiverse <laughs> theories is that there's no conceivable experiment at this point that can uh, let you think that you're really on the right path. Uh, so, you know, we've, we've been, I, I think the, the phrase uh, falsifiability has actually been used already. So Karl Popper, this famous philosopher of science, he said that the way you distinguish a, a legitimate scientific theory from pseudoscience is that it has to make uh, predictions that are specific and rigorous enough so that you can actually go out and test them and possibly show that that theory is wrong. That's falsification. Now, some proponents of string theory and, uh, and multiverses, these parallel uh, universe uh, models that are a consequence of uh, string theory and, and lots of other uh, ideas in physics, they're saying, you know, falsification is overrated. We don't really need falsification anymore. Uh, Sean Carroll, who is this brilliant uh, physicist, very prominent, um, and he has said this about falsification. To me, that's changing the rules of science just to make it accommodate your, your favorite theory. And I actually see this as a, a disaster from a, a public relations point of view for physics because I think it, it makes uh, physics start looking kind of flaky. And, uh, you know, uh, science in general is under attack from many, many different uh, parts of our uh, culture, creationists, and global warming deniers, and so forth, and to have really prominent tenured professors at major university uh, defending multiverses and saying that testability falsification is overrated, I, I think is a really bad trend. He doesn't have tenure. He doesn't have tenure. <laughs> <laughs> and now forget it. <laughs>
do know about. There's also the stuff that we can identify in our experiments, for which we have no explanation for its behavior. And here I'm thinking about antimatter in particular. So antimatter is like a, a sort of a mirror version of normal matter. Uh, it's, it looks identical in every way, except it has the opposite charge, and it looks like a mirror version. And you just don't get very much of it around in the universe at the moment, but we think half the universe was made of it at the time of the Big Bang. And how you can go from half a universe to almost nothing is one of the great mysteries that we have in particle physics, in physics, I would claim. We have no underlying explanation at all in, in our standard model. There's, no, there's not even an underlying explanation of antimatter in any theory that I'm aware of. It can be incorporated in other theories, just sort of included to patch it up, but we really don't have a basic fundamental understanding. And it, yet it's a phenomenon we can see, we can measure experimentally. That tells me that there is far more to understanding the universe than we have. And that tells me that it is so important to just to emphasize it, to try these other approaches to understand the universe, to step back and open your mind a bit. Yeah, the, the universe is still really mysterious. It's, it's sort of this paradox that, that we've learned so much about how reality works, about the basic forces of nature and what we're all made of. And, and just to have discovered the expansion of the universe and to know so much about the origin of the universe and to have a, a kind of history of the entire universe is this unbelievable accomplishment that's really happened only, only very uh, recently. And um, I, I, I hate to, to say that I think it might be that we are bumping up against limits at this point in how much we can know. Can we go back before the Big Bang and understand where it, it came from in the first place? I still really have my doubts about it. inflation. It still feels very uh, hand-wavy to me. If I'm trying to be hopeful about, about the future of physics and cosmology, I seize on something uh, that you alluded to, that this discovery about 15 years ago, that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. So, you know, it's not just that the universe is getting bigger, it's getting bigger, bigger at a faster and faster rate. As far as I know, nobody saw that coming. And I think that's where the, the hope uh, would be for me is and stuff that's coming totally out of left field. It's totally unexpected. So you would like to see science driven by those experimental results rather than driven by new um, rational theories, based purely rational theories, you know, based on mathematics. It's being driven now, I think, to an unhealthy degree by certain conceptual biases. So, for example, the the compulsion for a unified theory. I, I think it, it looks like. I mean, who said that nature has to be describable by a unified theory? Maybe. Uh, maybe the, this world that we live in just happens to be described by different theories that apply to different aspects of nature, and this, this compulsion for unification is just something in our own heads. Yeah, so I'll, I'll say two things. Firstly about unification, but then I'll come back to dark energy and, and the expansion okay. of the universe. Um, you know, it's not just a question of, of unifying quantum mechanics and gravity that's driving us. It's a question of having them to be logically consistent mm -hmm. with each other. Th that's a you know, something that has to be true of the description of our universe, that, that it just makes sense. It, it's not a question of unification, it's just, just having theories that, that can sit, are compatible with each other. I think that's important, mm -hmm. um, and that's really what started research in string theory. Um, let, let me come back to, to dark energy. So, so as, as John said, it, it was the biggest surprise, um, certainly in my career as, as a scientist, that the universe is speeding up. There were people who had anticipated this. Mm -hmm. Very few, but um, there were a few people that had uh, thought this was going to happen. Um, this is 70% of the energy of the universe. 70% of the energy of the universe is like an anti-gravity force field spread throughout space and making everything repel each other. Well, that is a theory, isn't it? No, that's I mean, a fact. No, 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 no. No, <laughs> no that's a fact. <laughs> but, but we can argue about whether the, with the nature of the empirical evidence, but let's assume there is empirical evidence that the universe is accelerating. There's then a theoretical question of why. Oh, we and have a one, very simple what, theory one, that Einstein gave sorry? us that, that describes it absolutely perfectly. Oh, sure, but it's still a theoretical account of what it is. But it's a very good we one. Don't ha we don't yet have <laughs> evidence. We don't yet have empirical evidence of the dark energy, do we? The dark energy is an no, explanation. No, we have three, three different observations, all of which point to exactly the same amount of dark energy. They're very, very precise these days. 
Let, let, me, let me explain how precise they are. Um, when I was in a university in the 1990s, the universe was somewhere between 7 billion and 20 billion years old. Right? That, that's what I was taught when I was an undergraduate. These days, it's somewhere between 13.77 billion years old and 13.78 billion years old. That, that's how much we've improved our understanding. In large part, this is because of dark energy and how much we, we, we've got a handle on it. So it's, it's not up for grabs, it's just it's there in the universe. Um, but we, ne we need to understand it better. We need to understand the mechanism that's driving this expansion. And, and you're right, John, we, we don't. And I also agree with you. I think this is our great hope for, for something new. That th This is, for me, the biggest puzzle in, in theoretical physics, is, is where this is coming from. Um, there's one radical idea to explain this that has been put forward um, that may be the greatest uh, breakthrough in physics in the last hundred years, and it's the idea you hate most. It's the idea of the multiverse. Here's the deal. That there's some dark energy throughout our universe, and um, it's a bit strange. If it was a tiny, tiny bit more, we couldn't live here. If it was a tiny bit more, then the galaxies would have been ripped apart before they could have formed, and there wouldn't be any place for, for life to develop. If it was a tiny bit less and uh, negative, the universe would have closed in on itself uh, before it even got going. So somehow there's this little window for dark energy, and we happen to live in a universe that, that has this magical amount of dark energy, because we couldn't possibly live anywhere else. Now, that, that's a weird place to be in in physics, is to have that kind of argument for why a fundamental parameter in nature would exist. So the main reason for the multiverse, and I hate this, I have to say, I know I'm not a <laughs> believer, but it's the only solution I know for dark energy. The main uh, motivation for the multiverse is that there's a big, big universe out there. In some places, the dark energy is bigger. In some places, it's smaller. We just happen to find ourselves in the one place we can possibly live, where it, <laughs> it is. But, I don't buy this, but it's the only answer for dark energy. But I know. David, that's an anthropic argument, isn't it's it? It's an anthropic argument. That's oh, it, we have these arguments in physics, anthropic arguments, that mean that the universe is the way it is because it's the, it has to be like this, otherwise you wouldn't exist to observe it, basically. And is that really an explanation, therefore? If it's true, no. it's a great explanation. <laughs> the question is, how, how can it be true? So, so there, are, there are parallels in, in, in history. Um, why on earth do we find ourselves on a planet where water is somewhere between zero and 100 degrees? So it's liquid, it's not, not, not solid or vapor. And of course, it's random chance. And the reason it's okay that this is random chance is there's billions of planets out there. So we don't have to think about why we're on this one. It's just, just random. The same might be true of our entire universe, but you've got to buy into the multiverse idea. And you know, no one knows if that's, if that's true, if it's testable, if it's really science. I, I used to love multiverses. Um, I, I wrote a piece for Scientific American in 1990. I think it was, uh, the title was, Here a Universe, There a Universe. It was about all the different theories that predicted parallel universes. So one would be quantum mechanics, the, the many worlds interpretation. Uh, we've already talked about string theory. Inflationary theories also predict that there are lots of universes. There's this new idea uh, that uh, there must be in an infinite universe aliens out there who are really sophisticated who would have developed computers so powerful that they could create virtual worlds in their computers. And if you think about it, any one of these civilizations would probably create a lot of these virtual worlds. So chances are, if you find yourself in a world, uh, that you are in a virtual world. So that this right here now is a simulation created by aliens in another galaxy or another uh, universe. And, and I, you know, I, I like this in a kind of pot smoking late night sort of way <laughs> but it's but ultimately it brings out this self righteous moral prig in me because you know this is a real world with real people real suffering real problems and again i you know the spectacle of these very prominent uh scientists some of them surely must have tenure um <laughs> saying, saying these kinds of things uh, I find very dismayed. I think it's undermining the credibility of science, um, science as a whole. And the anthropic principle plus multiverses, you know, I talked earlier about how um, physicists hoped to show that there was a logical necessity to this world and, and to show that God did not have choice in creating the world. And then this new answer that they've come up with is the exact opposite of that. It's the equivalent of saying, uh, why, why does the universe exist? Because, or shit happens. It's just like this hand wavy, very disappointing uh, pseudo answer. Um, and I think obviously there, you know, we need 
more data to give us better ideas. Okay, so, so what's the what, what's the future from here? Where, where should we go from go from this? Is physics in trouble at the moment? It sounds as if you think it I, is. I think it's it's self evident that it is. I, physicists I know are all talking about the, the future of their profession. They're they're worried. There's certainly a lot of uh, chatter about that and uh, and uh, blogs and elsewhere. As I, I said earlier, I think I think you know. Uh, more imaginative experiments, maybe getting away from some of these uh, these theories that have given physicists a kind of uh, tunnel vision, even in the questions that they ask and the kinds of answers that they they uh, find uh, credible or or interesting. That that will be the future of physics. But uh, you know, when I meet young people who want to become scientists, I tell them to go into neuroscience these days. Tara. I probably be, wouldn't tell them to go into neuroscience. I'd still tell them to go into particle physics, just because there is so much that we know is out there that we have to understand. It's not like, it's not like that, that state in physics at the end of the 19th century when Kelvin proudly pronounced we'd seen the end of physics shortly before quantum theory came in and just disrupted the whole thing again. It's not like that. There's stuff out there that we have to understand. And it is within our capability to progress our understanding more, I think. And yet, yeah, we have to be clever about the types of experiments we do that can test the theories. The theorists have to be clever to develop the theories to allow us to test them. But that's what makes us want to do it. Even the knowledge of building our experiments spins off to benefit other areas. So don't say physics is a dead end, because it, it gives the world so much. <laughs> isn't, isn't the imagination of, of the current yeah. theoretical physics a good thing? Um, you know, I coined this term in my first book, The End of Science, scientific theology, um, to describe um, certain scientific ideas, or they're based, they're inspired by uh, scientific theories, and then they, they go so far uh, into speculation that they don't deserve to be How called would you decide science. where to put that, though? Where do you say, no, that's too far? Multiverse theory, I think, is, is, is a what kind is of it? crushingly obvious example. But as I said, I, I, I used to find those sorts of theories enormously exciting and inspiring and fascinating in the same way that I find great works of literature, science fiction, uh, exciting and inspiring. Uh, films that, you know, like The Matrix, that imagine all kinds of uh, different uh, realities. But what is different from science, or should be different, and fiction and literature and, you know, the arts, is this grounded, uh, it's imagination that, that keeps being dragged back down to earth by experiment, by the, you know, the cruel facts of uh, reality. And without that, it's not really science anymore. David? I, I think science is, is like that. As, as, as Tara said, the vast majority of science is, is connected with, with experiment. It's true that on the far end, there, there's uh, people thinking about deep ideas that we can't get in touch with yet by experiment. Um, but I think it's going to happen. I, I, I don't see any reason at all that, that this won't become uh, falsifiable science, maybe falsified science, which would be great. If we could kill string theory, I'd, I'd be delighted <laughs> by that. Um, I think we're going to know what, what it's about then. Uh, I'd like to thank the speakers for a really fascinating uh, insight into what's going on currently.